Uh, well, thank you everyone for being here on this beautiful uh, Sunday afternoon. Um, really appreciate it, and thank you for History Associates for uh, having me. Um, this really great opportunity to present um, an ongoing uh, research project. And as uh, Stefan mentioned in his introduction, um, this is a research project based on a 1937 interview done of a formerly enslaved person about his childhood under slavery. Um, and we'll talk about how I came across the interview and um, why I think it is uh, so interesting and so important in helping us understand um, slavery. But I just want to highlight uh, at the very beginning uh, that this research project is um, unusual for me and uh, very special for me. Um, my previous work has been about like the economic history of 19th century United States. And so I analyzed slavery as an institution, but I did not really kind of like um, incorporate the experiences of individual enslaved peoples in um, my research. I did it in my teaching, but that wasn't what I did. And so this is a project where for the first time I'm um, drawing upon the experience of someone who um, experienced uh, uh, slavery and writing about that in a very detailed way. This is like the first time in my research career where I feel like a really deep connection um, with my subject. And as you'll see, I've been kind of semi-obsessed with this story and in covering uh, uh, this uh, story. So let me talk about the origins of the project. I'll go back. And the origins of this project is frustration over a misplaced book. <laughs> and so in my teaching, I um, talked about um, the interviews the Federal Writers Project did during the Great Depression with, um, the formerly, uh, in, with formerly enslaved persons. Um, and these interviews, there are about 2,500 of them, are a very well-known source among historians of slavery and the Civil War. Um, and so I didn't really use these sources myself, but many other historians did, and so I would talk to them with students. Uh, I talk about the sources with students. Um, and I would generally rely upon kind of excerpts from edited collections. And when I started teaching in the 1990s, this was kind of standard. This was the early days of the internet. Um, it was hard to get those interviews um, other than edited collections of them. And one particularly important edited um, collection of these interviews, um, Remembering Slavery, had this great excerpt of an interview with an ex-enslaved person named Robert Glenn um, that I became really taken with. And plus, this book came with a cassette which tells you how old uh, <laughs> this was, an audio cassette of like well-known African-American actors yeah. reading the interviews. And so we'll hear James Earl Jones read a portion of Robert Glenn's interview in just a few minutes. So I couldn't find the book for this class I was teaching. I was frustrated and said, oh man, I have to actually look it up myself. <laughs> and so, all of the interviews are now at the Library of Congress a website. You can access all 2,500 of them. Um, and I easily found like the Robert Glenn interview. And then once I began to read the full interview, um, I thought it was so much better than just reading the excerpt in the edited collection. So one of the things that really came to life as I read the interview, the full interview, was how detailed the memory of Robert Glenn. And so he was 87 years old, and he was talking about events that happened when he was seven and eight years old. But his memory was very precise. He remembered the first and last names of his, of his enslavers. He remembered the names of the wives of his enslavers. He remembered the names of their children. He remembered particular places in particular towns. So this opens up the opportunity of connecting his oral history to a wide variety of primary sources. And so just kind of like set me off on trying to kind of link this interview to as many sources as I 
uh, as I possibly could. The second thing about the interview that really stood out is that the interviewer asked a list of standard questions. And so there were about like 12 to 15 standard questions that um, the respondents would be asked. Robert Glenn blew through all those questions and crafted a beautifully structured story that has real literary qualities. Um, he himself was functionally illiterate but he was a master storyteller. And that kind of like narrative structure really made this interview, um, to me, really unique um, and particularly exciting. Now, I also kind of uncovered another kind of like uh, uh, important interview he did in 1939, uh, two years later. It was an interview connected with the Federal Writers Project, but it was for a slightly different project. It was for a project, These Are Our Lives, which was the history um, of ordinary Southerners in the 1930s. And so this would be um, ex-slaves, it would be poor whites, middle class whites, um, a wide range of different people. Um, and this interview was somewhat longer than the one in 1937, but unlike the 1937 interview, it took events all the way up to the Great Depression, um, to 1939. He talked a lot about his life post-slavery. So as far as I know, he is the only person, ex-slave, to give two interviews to the Federal Writers Project. And it's on the basis of these two interviews that I'm trying to reconstruct his life and write a biography of Robert Glenn. <coughs> Now, I, I think you know this story is important to me because it's important to me. Uh, because <laughs> I spent a lot of time researching it. Uh, and like I said, I feel this like um, uh, 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 connection to Robert Glenn, this connection to um, the story. But from like a scholarly perspective, uh, what's kind of like the takeaway point, right? Why is this historically significant? Um, there's a number of different answers, but <coughs> the answer that uh, I have and that comes most clearly to my mind um, is that this story helps us understand the complicated balance between victimization and agency when we talk about slavery. This is kind of like one of the great difficulties I've always had in talking about slavery, um, and that it's, it's easy to present the horrors of slavery in a way that make the enslaved simply as victims. Um, and this is like the perspective that many students have taking our introductory history courses. Um, they are aware of the cruelty of slavery, of the breakup of enslaved families, of the physical punishment of enslaved people, all of the terrible things we associate with slavery uh, but then it turns the enslaved, by only emphasizing those elements, into victims and not full human beings. And they, they, they lack agency. And this is kind of like a narrative problem that goes back all the way to the early ab abolitionist. And you can see here on this early uh, abolitionist print. Um, oh, I need to turn this on. Uh, there we go. Uh, this uh, early abolitionist print, which is kind of a quite common image of uh, an abolitionist movement of the victimized enslaved person who is a supplicant, who is passive, um, who is waiting upon the white savior to rescue them, right? And so if you focus too much just on the cruelty and the horrors of slavery, you, you miss um, the, the humanity of the enslaved in an important way. Now the other problem is that when you only talk about the agency of the enslaved, then you present a much different kind of history. And you literally begin to whitewash slavery. You lose track of the horror and cruelty that's embedded in the institution. And so this is a controversy here, this headline of the state of Florida having new social uh, study standards 
um, that really emphasize the agency of the enslaved, but in order to make white students and white people feel that slavery was not so bad. Um, and so if you stress the agency too much, then you lose sight of like all the ways in which slavery was terrible. And in some ways, these, the Florida standards, which like emphasize how the enslaved learned skills, um, is not wrong. And we'll see that in Robert Glenn's story, he certainly learned skills under slavery. His father was a highly skilled worker. Um, but yet, taken out of context, it just loses sight of the totality of the experience of what enslaved people suffer. And so what I uh, think this story is so important, and as we will see, is that Robert Glenn's experiences in this story um, expresses in a way far better than I can when I teach slavery the complicated balance between victimization and slavery. It's an unflinching look at some of the horrors of slavery, but it never loses sight of the humanity of the Glenn family. All right. So with that in mind, let me jump right into the Glenn interview and play it for you for a little bit. Um, and this is about a five minute excerpt. This is like the first couple paragraphs of the Glenn WPA interview. Um, and this is read by uh, James Earl Jones. And this is one of the reasons why this interview um, was so important for me uh, as a teaching tool because um, this audio, I think, is really powerful. So let me go ahead and play it for you. Robert Glenn's father did his best to keep his family intact. He tried to purchase his son with the money he had earned. The distinguished actor James Earl Jones reads his words. I was a slave before and during the Civil War. I am 87 years old. I was born September 16th, 1850. I was born in Orange County, North Carolina, near Hillsboro. I belonged to a man named Bob Hall. He was a widower. He had three sons, Thomas Nelson and Lambert. He died when I was eight years old, and I was put on the block and sold in Nelson Hall's yard by the son of Bob Hall. I saw my brother and sister sold on the same plantation. My mother belonged to the Halls, and father belonged to the Glens. They sold me away from my father and mother, and I was carried to the state of Kentucky. I was bought by a Negro speculator by the name of Henry Long who lived not far from Herd de Mill in Person County. I was not allowed to tell my mother and father goodbye. I was bought and sold three times in one day. My father's time was hired out and he knew a trade. He had, by working overtime, saved up a considerable amount of money. After the speculator Henry Long bought me, mother went to father and pled with him to buy me from him and let the white folks hire me out. No slave could own a slave, so father got the consent and help of his owners to buy me, and they asked Long to put me on the block again. Long did so and named his price, but when he learned who had bid me off, he backed down. Later in the day, he put me on the block and named another price, much higher than the price formerly set. He was asked by the white folks to name his price for his bargain, and he did so. I was again put on the auction block, and father bought me in, putting up the cash. Long then flew into a rage, saying, you think you are white, do you? Now just to show you are black, I will not let you have your son at any price. Father knew it was all off. Mother was frantic, but there was nothing they could do about it. They had to stand and see the speculator put me on his horse behind him and ride away without allowing either of them to tell me goodbye. I figure I was sold three times in one day. Mother was told on the threat of whooping not to make any outcry when I was carried away. He took me to his home 
but on the way he stopped for refreshments at a plantation, and while he was eating and drinking, he put me into a room where two white women were spinning flax. I was given a seat across the room from where they were working. After I had sat there a while wondering where I was going and thinking about mother and home, I went over to one of the women and asked, Mrs., when will I see my mother again? She replied, I don't know, child. Go and sit down. I went back to my seat, and as I did, both the women stopped spinning for a moment, looked at each other, and one of them remarked, Almighty God, this slavery business is a horrible thing. Chances are this boy will never see his mother again. This remark nearly killed me as I began to fully realize my situation. Long, the Negro trader, soon came back, put me on his horse, and finished the trip to his home. He kept me at his home a while, and then traded me to a man named William Moore. Moore, at this time, was planning to move to Kentucky, which is what he did, taking me with him. Mother found out by the Grapevine Telegraph that I was going to be carried to Kentucky. She got permission and came to see me before they carried me off. When she started home, I was allowed to go part of the way with her, but they sent two Negro girls with us to ensure my return. We were allowed to talk privately, but while we were doing so, the two girls stood a short distance away and watched as the master told them when they left that if I escaped, they would be whooped every day until I was caught. When the time of parting came and I had to turn back, I burst out crying loud. I was so weak from sorrow, I could not walk. The two girls who were with me took me by each arm and led me along, half carrying me. Um, it's a it's a very um, uh, powerful segment um, of the interview, um, and it kind of highlights, I think, Glenn's storytelling uh, talent, um, as well as um, kind of um, the real sense of of, of sadness um, he feels in the break of um, of his family and being carried away from his family. And so let me try to kind of put some context to the story and fully develop the story in a little bit more detail because uh, in some ways it's a little bit more complicated, that auction and that sale than even Robert Glenn conveyed from his childhood memories. So just to start off in terms of context, um, Orange County, North Carolina is located in central North Carolina. It's part of the research triangle um, now. Um, uh, in the 1840s and 1850s, um, it was not part of the Cotton Belt. Um, uh, plantation owners and slavers grew a mix of corn, of wheat, and livestock integrated with tobacco. It was very diversified agriculture, more like northern agriculture than what we stereotypically associate with the South. Um, but at the same time, Slavery was a thriving institution. 40% of the population in 1850 and 1860 was enslaved. Now, because the enslaved population had um, a large natural increase, the fact that the slave population was stable between 1850 and 1860 actually indicated that the domestic slave trade was thriving. The enslaved population should have grown by 25 to 30 percent. The fact that it was stable meant that many enslaved persons were being forcibly taken mostly to cotton states like Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana. And so it's kind of a, an odd place in which slavery is significant, slavery is thriving, but the slave trade is also thriving, and it's essentially exporting in, uh, enslaved people to other states. Now, Glenn notes that he belonged to Bob Hall, who was a widower 
Um, he had three sons, Thomas, Nelson, and Lambert. And so um, Bob Hall was Robert Hall, also known as Robert Sharper Hall. And in the second interview, Glenn conveys um, that nickname. Uh, so he was kind of like, not like a hugely wealthier, wealthy enslaver. He was not like, you know, kind of like the enslaver that's portrayed in Gone with the Wind. He was more of a middling enslaver. He owned like five to 10 enslaved people was not prominent in state politics or national politics, but was very prominent in his kind of small corner of Orange County known as the Little River Neighborhood. And in fact, the Hall clan, this extended kinship group, was quite significant in the area. There were 52 different Halls in 1850 who had a direct relation with Robert Hall. Now, Robert Glenn mentions three sons, but uh, Robert Hall actually had eight children. Um, there's a reason, though, that Thomas Nelson and Lambert uh, stand out. So Lambert is actually a grandson who resides on the plantation because Robert Hall is um, elderly. He's in his 80s and obviously needs help. And so Lambert Hall is hired to help him. And so it's almost certainly the case that Robert Glenn would have interacted with Lambert. Mm -hmm. Nelson Hall is the youngest son, and he's the executor of the state. And as Robert Glenn says, it is in front of his home that the auction took place. And in fact, that home still stands today. And Thomas Hall lived right next to Nelson, and so Thomas would have most certainly been at that auction as well. And so these three men really stand out in Glenn's memory. Now the story behind the auction is, 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 is complex, and how this auction came to be. And it was a product of different choices made by Robert Sharper Hall and the Hall children. So the story kind of like begins really, you can say, in 1843 with Robert Hall's will. So his uh, wife had passed away in 1841. As Robert Glenn indicated, he was a widower. Um, and so he obviously is rewriting his will. And in that will, he mentions five enslaved people. I'm fairly confident this is all the enslaved people that he owned. He owned four men named Lewis David, Edmund, and Daniel, and one girl named Cincy. So he leaves to five of his children one of these enslaved persons, right? And, um, and so that means three of his children did not inherit any enslaved person and presumably received like more land and other assets from the Hall estate. And so the, the eight, five of his children received one enslaved person each. Now what makes this really interesting is that all five of the children who stand to inherit uh, as an enslaved person are all local, right? They live nearby. The three who don't live in either Mississippi or Alabama. So this is an attempt, perhaps, by Bob Hall of kind of keeping these enslaved individuals within the family, within the area. And yes, their lives would have been definitely been uh, upset by, um, you know, uh, 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 suddenly having new enslavers, um, living on new farms and new plantations, but they would have avoided the auction block. Um, and so maybe perhaps there, there is this kind of like um, intent in keeping the enslaved um, literally in the family. Um, although I, will, I can talk about in, during questions, um, there is good reason to believe that this intent was subverted by the end of Robert Hall's life um, because there's evidence that perhaps the children, right before Robert Hall died, sold these five enslaved people and then split the proceeds from themselves um, after uh, Robert Sharper Hall passed away. Now, a key provision in the will is, quote, all my other property to be sold by my executors 
and equally divided between the above named heirs. Now, this is the clause of the will that means Robert Glenn will be on the auction block when Robert Hall dies. Because Betsy Hall, his mother, is acquired by Robert Hall after the will has been written. She's not mentioned in the will, and so she would be sold um, unless the will was revised, which it was not. Now, this brings up um, Robert Glenn's parents. So he says his mother belonged to the Halls. I think there's good evidence that indicates that uh, Robert Hall acquired Betsy somewhere between 1843 and 1850. Um, I think she shows up in the 1850 census, but it's not um, definitive. And um, uh, Robert Glenn says his father belonged to the Glens. Um, actually, his enslaver, the Glen uh, uh, who owned him, um, who was named Glenn, had passed away, and he was actually hired out by somebody named Harrison Parker, who will become important at the auction. Now, one of the things to note is that um, we know that Robert's mother, Betsy Glenn, um, and his uh, father, Squire Glenn, um, had been married in 1847. And the reason we know this is that after the Civil War, um, the formerly enslaved people could register the marriages they had made in slavery, and we have that record. And so they would have been uh, married in 1847. And so the last record we have of them together is 1910. So this was um, a very long marriage. Now, he, uh, uh, Robert Glenn notes that his father's time was hired out, that he was a skilled worker. In the second interview, he indicates that uh, he, his father was a, a blacksmith. And this is kind of like an important point here because um, this is something that we don't typically associate with slavery, but that historians have found more and more evidence of. And that is that there were enslaved people who um, actually had savings, who actually owned property. There were enslaved people who could act as petty entrepreneurs and buy and sell goods. In the case of Squire Glenn, he was the small minority of highly skilled enslaved workers who essentially could hire himself out, make money, send some of that money to his enslaver, but then keep some of his own. And so this is how he comes to have resources in order to able to influence the auction. Now, one of the things we have are the papers of the probate papers of Robert Hall. So we actually have the records of the auction that Robert Glenn discusses. And I know they're hard to read um, here on this uh, uh, blurry PowerPoint. Um, but this is the auction records that Robert Glenn discusses in his interview. And there's a couple different things to highlight. So Robert Glenn mentions in kind of almost an offhand way, I saw my brother and sister sold at the same plantation. And he was referring to his um, sister, uh, Mary Frances, and his older brother, George. And this, in a way, underrates what was happening from the perspective of the Glenn family. Because it just wasn't these two children and Robert Glenn who were in the auction block, but it was the entire Glenn family, with the exception of Squire Glenn. Remember, Squire Glenn is not owned by the Halls. He's owned by somebody else. And so this is like, um, you can imagine the stress and tension of this day from the standpoint of the Glenn family. And so they're not without resources, they will fight, but uh, it's just like unimaginable how hard this day could have been with Betsy Glenn and the Glenn children all on the auction block. Now, I want to add one other point here, and that Betsy Glenn is um, on the auction block, 
and she has just given birth. And in fact, the auction was delayed by her pregnancy, in fact. So it was almost always the case in other estate records that when the household goods are sold, the enslaved will be sold at the same time. You would have the estate sale all on one day. So when Robert Hall dies in December of 1857, all of the household goods are sold, but none of the enslaved people. But we have the records on April 1st, 1858, is when the enslaved people were auctioned off. And the reason for that, I'm supposing, is because Betsy Glenn was pregnant, and for various reasons, the Hall family did not want to put a pregnant woman on the auction block, um, perhaps fearing that it would lower the price for her since mortality rate um, during childbirth was sufficiently high that it might scare off some buyers. And so they delayed the auction. Now, as I said, and as Robert Glenn said, um, he, was brought by a, what he terms a Negro speculator by the name of Henry Long, who lived in Person County, which was very close to Orange County. Now, it's important to realize that Henry Long is the one enslaver that the Glenn family is really worried about. According to the records, uh, Robert's um, a sister, Mary Frances, and his brother, George, are sold to a local enslaver named John Peed. But Peed is an enslaver, but he lives nearby, and he doesn't seem to be engaged in the slave trade. And so the family is probably concerned, but not as worried as being sold to Henry Long. And in fact, we know from the census records of 1870 that after emancipation, both Mary Frances and George are living with um, Squire and Betsy Glenn. So that family has been quickly reunited. Now, Betsy and her two young children, one an infant, one um, two years old, named Bedford and Washington, have been sold to Harrison Parker. Now that's really important because remember Harrison Parker is the man who is de facto enslaver of Squire Glenn. And so in a way, you know, there is some indication that Squire Glenn has been able to manipulate the auction so that him and his wife um, are living on the same plantation. Um, and Harrison Parker was a longtime friend with the Halls. There's a longtime family connection. Um, they lived nearby. And it's also significant that Harrison Parker was the crier of the auction, the guy doing the actual auctioning off. And so that gives him the ability to help manipulate the sale. And so when Robert Glenn says, father got the consent and help of his owners to buy me and then asked Long to put me on the block again, He's definitely, well not definitely, but I think it's probably certain he's um, referring to Harrison Parker. Mm -hmm. and that Harrison Parker is working with Squire Glenn. We don't know the, the, the details of that relationship, um, but at least it was um, good enough that Squire Glenn felt comfortably bidding on Robert through Harrison Parker, who, all, who after all had purchased his wife and his two younger children. <laughs> now, Robert then you know, goes through um, the, the bidding at the auction and says, I was brought and sold three times in one day, um, indicating that there was a bidding war going on. And the, defi the evidence definitely indicates that was the case. Um, and the strongest uh, evidence, um, I don't know how well you can see this, is that William H. Long, Henry Long, paid $669 for Robert, which is more than, Robert older, uh, than Robert's older brother, George. And usually the older you were as a child, the more you were sold for. So this does kind of like suggest that um, Henry Long paid more for Robert than you would necessarily think. Um, and that Robert was right, and that there was a bidding war, which unfortunately his father lost. 
Now, I just want to say that there's all kinds of evidence to suggest that this was not unusual for Henry Long. And that Long was what I would call a child trafficker, someone who specialized in the buying of slave children without any adult relative. So there is evidence from other estate sales of Henry Long buying children. And then if you look at the 1860 census, you can see the ages of the enslaved people that Henry Long owns. He owns 12 enslaved people, and nine of those are 13 and younger. And so it's a strong indication that he was specialized in the buying enslaved, and selling of enslaved children. And in many respects, this was not unusual for this part of North Carolina. So to be clear, child trafficking wasn't prevalent in all parts of the South. In fact, in the Deep South, many enslavers viewed children as more of a burden. They needed to produce cotton as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. They weren't interested in long-term investment in children. They believed that children made enslaved women less productive. And so enslaved children um, were not as highly valued in the cotton states. And in fact, in the cotton states, it was sometimes recognized as a moral evil. And so they knew there was something particularly wrong with selling enslaved children without their parents. And so Louisiana, for example, made it a law that you cannot sell a child separate from both parents if that child was under 14 years of age. And uh, Alabama has um, a similar law as well. And so there's a recognition that this particular type of sale is particularly evil, um, even for the supporters of slavery. But in central North Carolina, for different reasons, children were highly valued as investments. And so um, because you had a mixed farming regime, uh, food was more plentiful in places like central North Carolina, so it was easier and cheaper to keep children fed. The work regime was different. So like looking after livestock, children could be um, more productive and more useful. Um, than on a cotton plantation. And it's also the case that the price of children was relatively low. So if you're a modest enslaver and you're looking to move up, buying enslaved children at a low price and then seeing them grow, become healthy, and then selling them later on is a viable business model. And part of this is that mortality rates are somewhat better in North Carolina um, with a somewhat more moderate climate than in places like the Cotton Belt. And I won't go through the evidence here, but there is uh, lots of it to indicate from census records, from deed books, from receipts of slave sales, from estate records that, that suggest that child trafficking in central North Carolina was utterly routine um, and that it happened um, all the time. Yes? Approximately what year or decade was this? Uh, this would be in the 1840s and the 1850s. Okay. The two decades before the Civil War. Uh, one other kind of like point to make that because children were more valued in a place like Central North Carolina, that there was more value placed on the reproductive capabilities of enslaved women. Um, and I think it's important to point out from the state records that the single most valuable asset that Robert Hall owned at the end of his life were the reproductive capabilities of Betsy, right? And that they were sold at the auction um, for more than $3,000, which was worth more than the value of his land and his other property. Now, through all of this, I want to just point out that it's, 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 it's the, the, the cruelty here is terrible, the, 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 the built-in um, system of breaking up families is awful, but yet in the interview, Robert Glenn makes, sure, makes us understand that the Glenn family never lost their humanity and never lost a sense of agency. 
First thing I want to point out is how angry Robert, I mean Henry Long is when he learns that Squire Glenn has been bidding on his child. And Squire Glenn isn't challenging slavery in any fundamental way. And in fact, you can make an argument that he's participating in the slave auction. He's making enslavement more valuable in a way to enslavers. But that's not how Henry Long sees it. And Henry Long sees Squire Glenn as in a challenge to the entire system of slavery. And I won't get into this now, but this is also, by the way, a critique of Harrison Parker, right? And some of the other enslavers, because he's implicitly saying to them, look, this is a system built on white supremacy by treating Squire Glenn as an equal, aren't you undermining our entire system? And so um, Henry Long views the actions of Squire Glenn as a fundamental challenge to slavery and to his family. Uh, the fact that Betsy Glenn was told not to make an outcry under the threat of punishment um, as Robert was carried away, I think, is significant. Um, and that the breakup of families and child trafficking may have been routine, but there was still an underlying sense of shame mm -hmm. by the enslavers. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you so troubled by mm -hmm. Betsy's outcry, right? It means that, that they, they know that they're doing something wrong. Um, or at least part of them recognizes that and, and don't want to be reminded that these are human beings they're dealing with. Now, part of the most significant element here um, is, is that uh, Betsy Glenn is able to say goodbye to her son um, just before he was being carried away from Kentucky. Um, how she found out about this and how that visit took place, um, it isn't clear. Um, but again, this is a moment of agency. This is a moment of humanity. I just want to end the talk by saying that it turned out that this conversation was totally important for Robert Glenn because he talked about after he was freed and moved away from Kentucky to Illinois where he lived for many years, he was always haunted by the memory of his mother. He couldn't forget his mother, which undoubtedly stemmed from this conversation. So in 1879, Robert Glenn finally decides to confront his childhood trauma. And he takes a train to North Carolina and finds his family and reunites with his family. Um, and in a way, what Betsy Glenn did with that last conversation is instill that enduring power of memory and love into Robert um, that uh, I think recognized um, his humanity and, and the humanity of the Glenn family. So there's a lot more to tell about this story, <laughs> but as you can tell, uh, but let me stop here at the end of this um, first interview and um, uh, let me know if you have um, any questions. I'm very curious to see your thoughts. So thank you very much. <laughs>